consumers are concerned about the future. They're worried about inflation continuing, job prospects, and what it means for their finances, their personal finances, and also for their incomes. You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of subjects that matter most to business leaders. To help make sense of these topics, we sit down with thought leaders and do what we do best at the Conference Board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Erin McLaughlin, Senior Economist of the Conference Board and guest host of today's podcast episode. In today's conversation, we're discussing the state of the global economy. First, we'll look at our newly released data on consumer confidence in the U.S. Then we'll dig into the economic outlook for the global economy. Joining me today is Dana M. Peterson, Chief Economist at the Conference Board. Welcome, Dana. Hi, Erin. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Excellent. Well, let's get started with the U.S. Consumer Confidence Index released today. What is the main message C-suite executives should take away from the report? I think they should take away this fact that consumers are concerned about the future. They're worried about inflation continuing, job prospects, and what it means for their finances, their personal finances, and also for their incomes. Okay. So what caused the movement in the overall confidence index? Sure. Well, the confidence index fell for the second month in a row, and it was moved by expectations. So the expectations gauge fell below 80, and 80 is the threshold that usually signals recession within the next six months. And so we've been in around 80 for almost a year. And there was a period of time over the summer where consumers were thinking, well, maybe there won't be a recession, or they were less convinced. But it seems like now that um, a number of economic factors are weighing on them, they're Mm -hmm. thinking, okay, maybe there will actually be a recession. Okay, and two months in a row. So was there any differentiation between the age and income of the confidence of the those that responded? Well, across ages, everyone was a little bit more disgruntled. Okay. <laughs> um, and by income, it was kind of mixed. But for the most part, we've been seeing that folks across the income spectrum are being challenged. And in particular, folks who are kind of in the middle. And if you think about it, those are the people who may not necessarily have excess incomes or savings from the stimulus checks, and they also aren't getting supports from other areas. So they're really getting squeezed by higher inflation and the fact that wages are not rising as quickly as they were. As quickly as they were. So what's driving the changes in the present situation, what I'm hearing, as you said, is inflation, prices, but we're also seeing some changes in student loans, a little bit of a credit crunch. Can you tell us some more about those factors? Sure. So when we look at credit card debt, we are back on the pre-pandemic trend. So it's more than just the the point where we were before the pandemic, but back on the trend, which was upward. And what we're seeing is that consumers are piling up on credit card debt. Balances are rising. Delinquencies are on the uptick, especially Mm -hmm. delinquencies that are more than 90 days late. We're back at the pre-pandemic level. And we're also seeing defaults pick up. And the key thing about that is not only is that bad for the consumer, the individual who's experiencing that, but it also has negative implications for banks that are carrying these credit card loans. Mm -hmm. Um, And indeed, when we look at who has a lot of this credit card debt on their balance sheets, a lot of it is you know, banks and also other financial institutions. Right. And this debt is at a higher interest rate now than it was before. Yes, it is. Indeed, the Fed has raised interest rates by 525 basis points since March of last year. They paused at this last meeting, but they already signaled in their summary of economic projections that there's one more hike to go. And then even next year, maybe there are only two rate cuts. So that's not a lot. So that means interest rates are going to be higher for longer. And if you have a credit card balance, it's going to be very expensive to carry that. Right. Now, you mentioned that when we see confidence fall to where it is now, we can expect possibly a recession within the next six months. Is that what our current forecast is seeing at the conference board? Yes, it actually matches up very well with our forecast. We anticipate that there will be a recession a short, a shallow recession, um, we keep saying, and we still believe that. 
it's been pushed out to the first half of next year. And the reason why we keep pushing it out is because essentially the consumer has been more resilient in terms of their mm -hmm. consumption than expected. And consumer spending is roughly 70% of right. the economy. And if you add on housing, which is something consumers buy, which is another 5%, that's most of the economy right there. So it, as consumers have continued to spend, they have been bolstering the economy. But there's definitely some indicators now that are suggesting things are slowing. So in the last retail sales report, consumer spending in real terms was negative. Okay. Right? And also and importantly, people spent less on the one services item, which is restaurants, right? Oh, so yeah. that's that's a discretionary type of thing. Right. And so people are pulling back on discretionary things as well as, and they're shifting more towards buying things they need, like food and energy, mm -hmm. then that's really telling. So consumption, at least in that month, slowed. But consumers are also experiencing less in terms of what we call excess savings. So it's basically savings over and above what you think that consumers would normally have. Mm -hmm. And that excess savings amounted to roughly $2.2 trillion after inflation in aggregate at the height of all the stimulus. Okay. And now it's kind of in the, well, since the second quarter it's dwindled to around 173 billion. Oh, wow. So you've okay. gone so from a trillions big, a big cut. Yeah. to billions. And so we think that's pretty much going to run out by the end of this year, right? So that's less of a cushion. And for consumers that spent it all in the past, they're the ones who are leveraging up and using credit card debt to buy basic things like mm -hmm. gasoline and food, which are still expensive. And indeed, gasoline prices have risen and may continue to rise for some time, given the fact that OPEC has pulled back on production. So those elements, and then as you mentioned, right. student loan repayments. So those repayments, or at least the interest on those payments, are going to return in October unless mm -hmm. there's some something, some, some policy some or regulation or change, legislation, right. some big change that you know is legal and gets pushed through that can forestall that. If not, that's a lot of spending um, money. Spending money right. that, you, that you might have you might spent not on be going to restaurants as much as exactly. you're having to pay your student, student loans, loans or interest. Absolutely. Right. And um, so that that's definitely going to be somewhat of a, a personal fiscal cliff for a lot of folks. And it's right. really um important because it's it most of the people who have student loans are under 45. Yes. And that's kind of like your peak spending years, right? That's when you get a job, you've saved, you're having children, mm -hmm. starting families, mm -hmm. you might buy a home you know, all those things. And it's like, well, you can't accomplish those things or do those things comfortably if you have massive student loan debt. Right. So this is, so we see these headwinds. And then finally, there's a labor market. Yes. Where the labor market is slowing. Right. We're seeing fewer so job openings. That might cause people to change their behavior a little bit as well. And if, indeed they, they yeah. are. And we're seeing that in the quits. So okay. the number of quits or their quit rate mm -hmm. is back to where it was before the pandemic. So it really spiked during the pandemic and then in the year after, because people were thinking, well, I have options, but now right. there are fewer options because there are fewer job openings. And so fewer people saying, hmm, maybe I don't have as many options. Maybe I should sit tight. And indeed you are seeing that maybe it's okay to sit tight because many companies are hoarding labor and holding on to people. Right. But there are also companies that are letting people that are letting go. letting people go. And, and that might be specific to the industry of that exactly. company, I imagine. Yes. Yes. So we know the Fed, as you said, might very likely cut, I'm sorry, raise the rate one more time this year. And then next year, perhaps lower the rates a couple of times. Do you want to talk to us about the timing of that or what we think the timing of that might be? Yeah, I think the timing of those rate cuts, it's probably in the second half okay. of next year, because the key thing is where is inflation, mm -hmm. right? And right now, both overall inflation and inflation, less food and energy are still very elevated. In fact, overall inflation is going in the wrong direction. It right. started rising again. And a yes. lot of that is gasoline yes. prices. Which people purchase every week yes, usually. Like... So they feel it. They know it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. And um, certainly that's what people were complaining about in, in their writing questions in our consumer confidence measure. They're still very concerned about right. gas and food prices. Yeah. So in terms of the timing, 
by the second half of next year, we think we'll be much closer to 2% inflation. Okay. And so, which and is the Fed's target, even though it we is haven't the Fed's been here target. in a while, right? right. Well, yeah. I, right. I mean, we spent most of the last 40 years under 2%. Right. Right? And so this is very new to be so well above it. But we think that by, you know, certainly the middle of next year, we'll be closer to 2.5%. Mm-hmm. And the Fed will feel confidence that, yes, it can get to 2%. But even still, their forecast for inflation, they don't have inflation getting back to 2% until 2025. Okay. That sounds <laughs> so, far away. Two right. years, so, a year and a half, two years. So yeah. it could be the case that they feel that, okay, well, the easy gains will be gone and it'll take longer you know, to asymptote to mm-hmm. 2%. But even with that, they're saying, even if we're at 2.5% by the end of next year, we're still comfortable around half, you know, halfway, but we don't know because they just provide a forecast for where the Fed funds rate is going to be right. at the end of the year. So a lot of it's speculation, speculation, but just looking at our own forecast, we think that that would make sense. And um, indeed, we actually have, a, you know, inflation coming down even faster than what okay. the Fed expects. So we could see more than just two rate cuts. Okay. So the Fed, obviously they have their eyes on the inflation numbers. They also have their eye on the unemployment rate. And, you know, we know that sort of the quit rate has gone down a little bit, but we have some sort of demographic trends that will continue to keep our unemployment rate very low for the next few years. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So what is happening, and this is the first time we've ever experienced this without an easy solution, is we have massive labor shortages especially in those industries where you have to physically show up for work right. or in the trades, which again, mm-hmm. most time you have to physically show up to work, but trades, healthcare. And so you have millions of people retiring. The baby boomers. The baby boomers. More of them than there are us Gen Xers. Yes. Exactly. Yes. And so <laughs> they're leaving the labor market and they're taking their skills and experience with them. And so that means that you just have fewer people who are going to be entering into the labor market. So, and usually when someone enters the labor market, you start off unemployed. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You're just, it takes a few months Mm -hmm. to find a job. So you might be unemployed for a couple of months before you become employed. But if you have fewer people who are exiting than entering, entering. that brings down the the level of people who are unemployed, right? So, and that affects the unemployment rate. Mm -hmm. Um, still, we think the unemployment rate will probably rise to around 4.2%, Okay, probably in the second or third quarter of next year. So that's not the end of the world. It could be much higher, but that's still equivalent to roughly 700,000 job losses. Right. So if that's you, that doesn't feel good. That's your own personal right. recession. And of course, we don't we don't want job losses. However, I would love a soft landing. <laughs> soft landing. But the data are telling yeah. us and the circumstances are telling us that we may not get that soft landing, that we may have that short and shallow recession. And indeed, not only does our consumer confidence measure point to that, but CEOs that we have this once a quarter are still signaling that. And also our leading indicators has been negative mm-hmm. for almost 17 months. That's a long time. Yes. Okay. We're going to take a short break and be right back with more of my conversation with Dana M. Peterson. Are you ready to transform your business and stay ahead of the competition? Artificial intelligence is quietly reshaping the global economy, optimizing manufacturing processes, and transforming how users interact with popular platforms. Harnessing the power of AI can exponentially enhance your business's effectiveness and efficiency. However, navigating the risks associated with this transformative technology is critical. Privacy, integrity, the economy, and humanity are all at stake. That's why the Conference Board is your go-to resource for the expertise and foresight you need to leverage AI to its fullest potential and make strategic moves that propel your business forward. Unlock the possibilities AI offers your business. Visit tcb.org slash AI today to access trusted insights for what's ahead and guidance on navigating the AI transformation. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your guest host, Erin McLaughlin, Senior Economist of the Conference Board, and I am joined by Dana M. Peterson, our Chief Economist. Dana, you wrote in your recent Straight Talk series about economic trends C-suite executives should watch. Let's talk about the ones that might affect global economic growth. 
First, you mention a possible resurfacing of the U.S. banking crisis due to commercial real estate, something something I've been following closely. What is the connection to the global economy? Sure. Well, the U.S. is part of the global right. economy. That's <laughs> a big part. <laughs> the U.S. part is one third of the global economy. And whenever there's stress in the U.S. financial market, it tends to metastasize and cause some contagion elsewhere. And so we saw in March earlier this year, and you and I talked about mm -hmm. this with the banking crisis, where you had roughly three banks in the U.S. that failed in right. less than in, within weeks of each other. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a variety of reasons for why that happened. But nonetheless, it caused fear. Right. And the fear is that people run to the bank and take their money out. And the thing is that, like, you don't even have to run to the bank. Exactly. You can just get on your cell phone. It's even faster than 15 <laughs> years ago during the great financial you exactly. know, crisis because, you know, in 2008 or nine, not everybody had a smartphone. Now right. so many people bank with their phones and things can happen so quickly. Exactly. Right. And so the inflammation or the fire that was right. ignited was put out, it was dampened. It's still mm -hmm. an issue. You still have many, many banks uh, in the U.S. that are borrowing from the Fed and drawing from the window mm -hmm. to stay liquid because that was the problem. There wasn't enough liquidity. liquidity. Yeah. But over the summer and in recent weeks, we've seen a bunch of banks being downgraded by ratings agencies. Mm -hmm. and indeed, one rating agency downgraded the entire sector right? because there's concern about commercial real estate, which is something that you just wrote a paper yes, on. I did. So I encourage everyone <laughs> to get out there and read Aaron's paper. It's it's a must read. Thank you for the plug. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and it's not just commercial real estate, it's also consumer credit. So let's start off with consumer credit. So consumers, as, as you mentioned, as we talked about a few minutes ago, are leveraging up. They're adding a lot of debt to their credit cards. And these credit card balances, if you don't pay off the balance or if you miss your monthly payment, you're going to hit with be hit with massive amounts of interest. And the interest mm -hmm. rate is much higher much now higher. than it was since mm -hmm. because the Fed has raised, raised rates. And so we're finding people becoming delinquent. And again, who holds most of these credit card loans? Who's issue, who are the issuers? It's banks. It's banks. And a lot of them are small and medium-sized yes. banks. And indeed, when we look at the banks that we're looking at charge-offs, the charge-offs are have skyrocketed among banks that are not in the top 100. And so right. a lot of them are small and medium-sized banks. And then when we look at commercial real estate, again, read the report, everybody, <laughs> many, most of the, the, the exposure to commercial real estate are banks. Right. And again, it's these kind of, banks in, yes. in that, the middle and just beneath regional the regional bank they hold the highest percentage of investor owned commercial real estate some as high as 40 to 45 percent which you know absolutely if some of these banks have to take uh big losses on those loans it will affect them greatly yes and so that could be the next shoe to drop mm -hmm. and layer that on with consumer credit that all sounds like a really bad scenario for small banks. And let's remember in the U.S., there are roughly 4,500 banks, 4,500 yes. banks. And if a bunch of them, even if like 20, 30, 50 of them get into trouble, who's going to come to the rescue? And will that cascade throughout the U.S. financial market and into global financial markets? So those two things have implications. And certainly when people get scared and they hear on 1010 wins for those of you in New York or on the radio and the news that there's a crisis and that maybe it involves their local bank, they immediately stop spending yes. and they pull back and they, and that will affect the economy. Yes. And certainly if the U S isn't growing as fast, the whole world grows as a slower at a slower yes. rate. So before we leave the U S is the impending possible federal government shutdown or brownout, as I've heard some people <laughs> some people describe it because it never really totally shuts down. What kind of impact would that have on our domestic and global economy? Well, it's interesting. This wouldn't be the first rodeo. We've right. had many, 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 many shutdowns. Many. And thousands um, of shutdowns, even more often, yes. Yes. And then and the thing is that it really depends on how long it is. If it's months and months, then it definitely has an economic impact. But for the most part, over the short run, it's it's more inconvenient. So government workers will be placed on furlough. And then when they're brought back, 
they're usually made whole, they get paid. So it's, it's annoying and it's unfortunate. Like you might miss your mortgage payment. I mean, that's terrible, but in terms of a macro effect, it's pretty minimal, but when it comes to policy and financial market functioning, it's a big problem because you will not have any data from the government agency. So that includes the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which puts out the the labor market Mm -hmm. data, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, that's GDP, the Census Bureau, that's retail sales and trade, international trade, construction spending. So there's kind of this blackout for data and that affects the, the Fed's ability to make decisions. Right. And they are data times, dependent. And if there's not enough data, then they don't right, move. They right. don't do anything. And, and also for financial markets that trade on these data and are trying to figure out what's going on in the economy, it's very difficult. And so in that sense, you have these disruptions that are negative. But but also if you're a business, um, the patent office is closed. Yeah. <laughs> so, uncertainty does not breed confidence. Exactly. And if you're waiting for, um, what are those called when you permits. Uh, yes. <laughs> you're not going to get those permits. So in that sense, it's it's really annoying and it, and it weighs on the economy in, in small ways. But if it lasts for a long time, it could take off like a half, you know, of a percentage point. It's not that big, right. but it's still very disruptive. Okay. Well, turning outside of the U.S., looking at China, why, what do we think is happening with China's economy right now? Well, the big concern is, will China go into recession? We think the answer is no, but China is going to slow. So we downgraded our forecast for China to just below 5% growth this year, and then around 4.5%. And and this is much lower than they've been growing. Yes. Yes. I mean, China's used to double-digit growth, or even in the high single digits, like 8 7%. And now we're getting below 5 And 5% is really kind of the magic number, because that's the, the number... That's the rate that the government is targeting. So missing target is quite significant. And the reason why uh, we don't expect a recession in China, because it's very hard to get there. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, China is still a developing economy. Right. And they tend to have high growth rates. So you need something like a pandemic, which did happen to have mm-hmm. negative growth rates. But it doesn't mean that the economy still won't be weak. And it's going to, it has been weak and it probably will continue to be weak because consumers are not spending. Consumers have been hit very hard by the housing crisis in China, and that has wiped out a lot of wealth. And unlike the U.S., where you do have a social safety net, there is none Hmm. in China. So that's why people, if they lose a lot of their savings or a lot of their wealth, they engage in something called precautionary savings, where it's like, just in case the world blows up, I I have this cash on hand because there is no social security, there's no unemployment insurance that that we things that we have in the U.S. Okay another topic you mentioned is a possible intensification of trade wars between the U.S. and China. How will that affect their growth? Yes so trade wars from an from a political geopolitical standpoint can have many reasons. So the reasons between the U.S. and China having this kind of chilly these chilly relations um, is about national security. Mm-hmm. It's about a number of things. Right. It's the strategic competition that these two economies mm-hmm. have along a number of fronts, including tech, trade, et cetera. But underlying it is national security. Mm-hmm. They don't trust each other. And right. certainly they're, they don't want to provide shipments of anything that might support armament, right? Or new, or there's, military preparedness. There's chips in everything, even, <laughs> right. even weaponry, certainly. Especially right. weaponry. Yes. So... So the U.S., as part of its policy, has said, look, we're not going to ship high-end technology, and especially computer chips, to China because we're afraid China might use them right. against us and so, you know, in products that they can use against us. And likewise, you know, China is also concerned about the, what the U.S. might do. And China said, well, you know what, we're just not going to ship you, you know, we're going to reduce our shipments of rare earths. Why mm-hmm. is that important? Rare earths are important inputs for batteries. Right. Um, so that would affect the auto sector mm-hmm. as well as defense sector and cell phones, anything that requires a battery. So in absolute numbers, the amount of trade between the U.S. and China in these particular products is really small, but it's about sending a message. And certainly this can metastasize, right? We could have 
blanket tariffs on everything the U.S. produces. So, for example, in the paper, we said, what if there's a 10 percent tariff on all Chinese imports? Mm -hmm. Well, China wouldn't stand for that. They'd probably also slap 10 percent tariff on all uh, U.S. imports. Yes. And at the end of the day, it means slower growth, less mm -hmm. less trade, slower GDP growth and higher inflation. And because China and the U.S. are so big, that impacts the global it, it, aggregate. So these relations, these geopolitical things and using economics as a tool of warfare is material for growth for both of the economies, but also the global economy itself. Right. So what other national economies outside of the U.S. and China do you have your eye on that possibly will be experiencing a recession or just have some really interesting things happening within them? Sure. So a number of economies have already experienced a short and shallow recession or a period of stagflation and are going to have very, you know, temperate recoveries like Europe. But we do think that the UK probably still has capacity to go into a recession. Okay. Um, Germany already had a recession. Right. It's coming out. The US, again, we think uh, recession. And then also um, potentially Argentina and um Peru and Chile will experience a recession. Some of that's from fiscal um, right. austerity in the past. Some of it's a political issues. But you know, for the most part, we are we are not, and we never have thought that there would be a global, a global recession. recession. The likelihood of that is still very small. Okay. And most economies are going to be kind of climbing out of the rut next year. But we're looking at very low growth. Indeed, we, we think that global GDP is going to slow to around 25 percent okay. next year, right? So that's actually pretty close to what we think the new potential or the long run. The new normal. The new normal okay. for growth. Okay. Well, this has been excellent. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Erin. And thanks to all of you for listening into CEO Perspectives. Each week, we feature a prominent thought leader to provide insights on the issues of our time. We cover the leading topics in economics, public policy, ESG, human capital, and more. Please share CEO perspectives with your colleagues. I'm Erin McLaughlin, and this series has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You have been listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board.